And we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to Whiskey Charlie and to the Armchair Dragoons Digital Convention. This is the first seminar. We're going to be talking with a couple of gentlemen from the Center for Naval Analysis about professional wargaming and hobby wargaming and how the two intersect and they diverge as well. We already had a fantastic conversation backstage. You guys missed out on it. You should have signed up for the extra backstage pass and you would have had some awesome conversation that you would have been part of. But I think we're going to have a really great conversation here tonight as well. Joining me are my guests, Chris Steinitz, who is also, you know, from CNA, and then Dr. Charles Cartier, both of them from CNA. And I really appreciate you guys coming in tonight. It's going to be a great talk. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having us. Based on the, uh, the, the preview backstage, I think this is going to be fun. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun. I was like, man, we're going to get all, we have all these questions already answered before we even get started. <laughs> this is great. I think, um, you know, one of the things you guys may have not understood was what the conversation was going to be. It's just going to be that session between us. Um, and I think it's just real casual. Uh, we have just the people that are going to be watching right now and asking questions uh, will be people from the convention themselves. Just a word to everyone in the in the audience and, and everyone that comes in. We will take questions, but we're not going to run this like we did with the happy hour and like we normally do on Whiskey Charlie, things like that, where we just kind of run wild and throw stuff up on screen and have a lot of fun. We're still going to have a lot of fun here, but this is going to be more of a directed conversation with these two gentlemen. I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation tonight. So we'll start off with you, Chris. We'll get to your background in gaming, design, what you do, and stuff like that. And then we'll go to Dr. Charles, Dr. Chuck. <laughs> Can we call you that? That's, I don't that's know what anyone who's called him Dr. Chuck and Lou. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, you first, Chris. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I have been at the Center for Naval Analyses for uh, about 14 years now. Um, and most of that time I've been involved in war games in one way or another. Although, um, you know, the way our, our you know, organization is, is uh, structured, I only officially made the jump to the wargaming team uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, but over 10 years, I've been doing uh, war games at CNA. Uh, I have a career uh, that really only makes sense at CNA. I arrived, uh, you know, I came on board as an Arabist. I thought I was only going to work projects uh, dealing with the Middle East and using my Arabic language skills. That lasted for uh, about a year. And then I started to get into Navy operations. I did a deployment on the uh, aboard the John C. Stennis um, and uh, spent some time uh, out in the uh, Indian Ocean, Arabian Gulf, uh, got into Navy operations, got into some Navy strategic development, did a lot of uh, analytic works on coalition building, uh, maritime security uh, cooperation, moved from being an analyst. I pivoted to Asia. Uh, started working Southeast Asia issues. I worked on the adversary analytics team where I was the director of the North Korea portfolio um, you know, for a while. And all along, uh, a key element of my learning these new, uh, new dynamics has been through uh, professional wargaming and being involved in wargaming project, projects for the Department of Defense, for the Navy, uh, for the Marine Corps. Uh, Etc. Uh, I'm also a uh, a hobby gamer. Uh, grew up on uh, Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop role playing games, uh, other board games, uh, etc. Uh, and as as we discussed before, I haven't traditionally played a whole lot of tabletop war games. Uh, even though I do uh, professional war games for the Department of Defense, they're slightly different. But uh, that's uh, we're going to get into that uh, in just a bit. I'm sure. There we go. Over to you, Charles. Thanks, Mel. Uh, so I'm Dr. Charles Cartier. Um, I, I started out uh, getting my chem, uh, PhD in chemical engineering at the Pennsylvania State University. And uh, uh, because my wife was moving to D.C., I, I realized I was going to be applying to a government job. And it turned out that that CNA was hiring. And so I applied for a research analyst position there. And I was initially applying for for uh, to go into data science, uh, maybe cybersecurity, something like that. That looked interesting to me. And I ended up getting pulled into an interview with uh, then the lead of, of the gaming team, Ed McGrady. And 
I, it was it was the most unique interview I've ever been in because we spent 30 minutes just talking about board games we both liked. And at the end of it, I, I asked him if he wanted to know my background at all. <laughs> and and he said, no, I'm a chemical engineer. I, I know all that already. Uh, so the um, yeah, I don't so, need to know that. Gaming is yeah. all I care about. <laughs> so so little did I know he he's, he pulled me into war gaming because uh, I, I both enjoyed commercial games and, and hobby gaming. Um, uh, uh, though, I, though I haven't, I, I wasn't really into the uh, the, the kind of historic style uh, tabletop war games uh, in, in the commercial world. Um, I, I was aware of them, but never really got into them. The uh, well at CNA, I've been at CNA for five years. I spent two years uh, with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, uh, helping them do uh, experimental design and analysis, and then three years with the with the gaming team. Uh, I'd, I'd call myself uh, experienced, but maybe not an expert in gaming. So I've done uh, uh, maybe 15 or 20 uh, games, uh, some role of facilitation, game design, project director on them um, uh, with, a, with a range of topics at this point, though, though most heavily on logistics uh, and, and particularly medical logistics. There's a number of games uh, 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 related to those under my belt at this point. Uh, and so it's really been very exciting and, and kind of uh, uh, nice to, to spend my time um, on, on, on using games to get a very squishy and very challenging problems in a lot of cases. So uh, over, that's me here. <laughs> there you go. Now, it was interesting when we were talking about that, neither one of you really, you know, Dr. Charles, you were talking about having played some war games, you know, some hobby war games that you inherited and you kind of thought you were like, ah, I'm going to go back to Axis and Allies, things like that. It was, a little, it was a little more than I wanted to go. When it comes to the rules that you saw in the commercial war games, and also, Chris, from hobby games, how do you compare them, would you say, complexity level and the time invested that were, or needs to be invested to read them and understand them? How would you compare that to what you guys do on the professional space or in the practitioner space as is really proper, the, I would guess, the proper term to use? Yeah, that's a, it, it's a great question um, because, as you know, if you, uh, if you sit down and play a, a, uh, a tabletop game, you know, a war game uh, or any board game, but war games tend to be more strategic and have a lot of complex rule sets, it takes a while to really digest that. Uh, and we were talking backstage, Mo, about how you might sit down with a game and, and you read it, you play through it once, and then you realize that you did something wrong. You didn't really get it right. You go back, you play it again, and it goes better, but you realize that there's something else that you did wrong. And then you have to play it through a few times before you really get into the game and know how to play. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, when we create a game for someone in the you know, uh, defense department, right, we do not have time you know, to, to, to sit down with military people and have them you know, learn a complex rule set, play through a game, realize they did it wrong, back up, do it again, play through three times so that we can finally get some real results. So what we have to do is when we create a game, it has to be a game that we can facilitate. Um, you know, for, I'm going to give a rule of thumb, but you know, this is, there's always exceptions. It's usually a game that we facilitate that we ourselves as the, the game designers know the rule sets and we can walk the players through that so that we can give them the instructions to give them the decisions they have to make to produce the re results that we want to examine when we do our analysis after the war game. Because the common thread in all the games that we design is that there is an analytic component, um, both before in the creation of the game uh, to make it as realistic to the problem set as possible um, and then there is analysis afterwards to say, well, what did that teach us about the problem? What can we learn and how do we move this forward? Charles, do you have uh, anything to add? Yeah, uh, I agree with everything there. And, and so the, the one thing I'll add is that there, there's kind of a range in terms of complexity to our games. On the very simple end, you, you almost get into design thinking sessions and, and post-it note games. Uh, is what I'll call them. They, they, they drift into facilitated discussions. We often refer to those as tabletop exercises. And then on the the, the very crunchy end of things, we do have um, uh, you know games which require a, a whole hex map laid out in front of you, pieces on the board. There's a full order of battle. There are rule sets for how each of these pieces move, uh, the weapon systems they employ, the logistics support to them. And uh, those, uh, at least in my experience, tend to be more rare on the um, uh, 
uh, on the professional side, at least for what CNA does. And, and often we use those for, for education internally. Uh, so I, I run um, uh, a, a training game for new analysts at CNA uh, where, where we place them, where we want them to feel what it's like to be in the shoes of a, a naval commander, where they have to face and understand tensions between kind of strategic objectives and the tactical limitations of the systems that they have. And so uh, uh, in, in that environment, uh, we, can, we can really kind of get into the weeds on what the tactical systems can do, what assets they have. Uh, and, and if you're new to the military environment entirely and, and don't really know a lot about the military, just learning very simple concepts like aircraft go significantly faster than ships. Uh, and there are a lot of limitations <laughs> uh, uh, to, to how fast ships can go and the, the posturing you can do with them. Uh, and, and other basic concepts like that can be really valuable to a, a newcomer. No, yeah. those are good points because uh, it's true. You know, you, what you said, just remember aircraft go faster than ships do because a lot of people's understanding of a lot of things, not just military, uh, but special military is, is learned from movies and they think, well, they're going to send this, you know, task force to the Indian Ocean. It'll be there in, I don't know, 20 minutes. No. Somewhere in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> you know, there's this big thing of water called the ocean, and there's yeah. multiple <laughs> ocean names that you got to get across. I mean, yeah. it's pretty huge. So um, it, that it, that's a great point. When, when I was in the military, we had, we used sand tables, and we did similar to what you guys were talking about where we, you know, I, I was an armor, so we'd have tanks. And we would not play a war game per se, but we would, you know, make up the sand table based on whatever map we were using or just make one up randomly. You got to get from point A to point B. Okay, here, move. And they would have, instead of having the tank commanders, you'd have the crewmen act as tank commanders. So you can think analytically and, and look at the terrain and say, okay, I'm just going to run up here. It's like, well, what about that saddle over there? There could be a, a ATGM in there or something like that. You may have a sagger waiting for you. Right. Oh, now you got to stop and think. And you weren't playing and rolling dice or anything like that. You were analyzing as you went. So it sounds like yeah. similar to what you guys are talking about. Yeah. So so what you're describing is a very tactical war game. And I think mm -hmm. you know, our, the initial answers we just gave are because a lot of the games we do are are really at the strategic, maybe high operational level. Sure. Right. But there are there are tactical games um, uh, that that do exist. Uh, as you said, uh, using a sand table is very, very common. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure that uh, some some people watching this have, are familiar with the uh, the original German Kriegspiel, you know, which kind of kicked off all the all the the the, the you know, war gaming, et cetera, including professional war gaming, and that was a sand table, but it just had codified rules for what happens when you know you, know, you have this many riflemen, you know, shooting a, a volley, and we do sometimes incorporate things like a combat results table. Right, mm -hmm. um, because you you need to find a result, but a lot of times we do that as a way to uh, kind of elide the complexity of a tactical problem or a low operational problem, uh, so that we can then uh, kind of advance the clock and look at the the bigger issues. So we're you know um, you know uh, we have a, a game we're designing now where we are you know we have to develop a, a combat results table, right? And we've got some data that we use for that, and we are borrowing from you know from the hobby game world. And like how we're going to structure it but you know it's because we have to have that component run pretty smoothly like clockwork so that we can then insert these other questions of all right so this is how you expect it's going to run but what about these special components that have not been accounted for what about these special actions like you know you've got this command they've got a new widget we don't know how that works we need the space to be able to explore how that is going to change the known equation Right. So we spend a lot of time kind of, you know, examining problems like that and pulling it apart. Um, you know, and there are other game systems out there that, uh, you know, for professional wargaming, uh, there's uh, a system called the operational wargaming, uh, well, operational warfighting system mm -hmm. right? um, that the, uh, the National Defense University uses. And, you know, it's out there and it's a it is a strict set of rules for for movement and you know uh, actions in in war that they can use then to to explore that we do do games uh like that a bit um but uh it's uh, our bread and butter is really the more you know strategic discussion you know operational type games 
Yeah, just to, just to interject before Charles says anything on that OWS, you were talking about that, and I was like, yeah, I've heard about that game, and that's the bits that I've read about it and and seen. I was like, man, I really want to play that. <laughs> it just sounds so cool. It sounds like very much like a commercial game in a lot of ways, yeah. uh, in many ways, and and it has those same type of structure. And I think it'd be real interesting, especially if it is um, geared around real world. Um, current modern, because then you're actually seeing things, not just a supposition based on a designer, based on James's data or whoever's data, right. you're seeing more accurate data. Obviously you have to be part of the government to see all that stuff and that's fine. But that I think is, is great. But again, it doesn't add in the human element. That's where you guys will add in the human element yourself. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I had, I, I've seen a demo of OWS. Uh, and I'm hoping to get uh, you know some some training on it in the not too distant future. But one of the beautiful things of it is that it does rely on on data from Jane's. And mm -hmm. you know, believe it or not, like Wikipedia is pretty pretty good. Pretty accurate, for, yeah. You know, because you got a bunch of nerds out there that are like looking at this <laughs> stuff and, and documenting it. You know, in yeah. an open source way, so you can you know, you can get good enough data to 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 run things. And so OWS can run in a completely you know public public setting. Right. Nice. So Charles. Yeah. Just, just kind of reflecting on what Chris was saying with the combat results table and, and how so much of what we do is really focused about player decisions more than is about whether team a or team B wins. Mm -hmm. And, and so one kind of a follow on a very kind of micro example of how, how this is important is just dice rolling and, and some players will, and some communities will, will really dislike the idea of dice rolling to the point where we'll design different mechanics to, to account for risk in different ways. Because ultimately, there's still some random component to, to what's going on and what decisions players are making. Uh, and, and one of my favorite examples is one of our colleagues has a Jenga tower in the game where, where players will, rather than roll dice uh, for when they take risk, they, they have to take a piece of the Jenga tower out and put it on top. And that, that reflects that risk is accumulating over time. But then mm -hmm. the players feel like they have a lot more ownership than just rolling the die and, you know, whether they get lucky or not. Uh, and so it's it's kind of this different psychological element that that comes into play that, that we may have to think about a little bit more because ultimately we don't want to distract players. The intention is it's cool, but it's not intended to distract. It's intended to get players away from, you know, getting into the very tactical details and, mm -hmm. and get them thinking more broadly about what decisions do we really care about. So they like the push your luck element of Jenga more than they do the yeah. random element of dice, even though you can, uh, and I don't know if you guys do this it, when it comes to dice rolling, you can actually still mitigate dice rolls based on dice roll modifiers and column shifts, things mm -hmm. like that. And yeah. they, they, they still don't like the dice rolling, huh? <laughs> Depending upon the community, yeah. So some yeah. some uh, some folks will 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 be more okay with it than others. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, sometimes you, you know your uh, your gamers when you break out the dice and they get excited, but you know uh, <laughs> sometimes you, you bring out the dice and there's going to be some some guy who's like, "No, nah, this is bullshit." Like it doesn't come down to yeah. the dice. It's like oh, you <laughs> then know? you know then you'll know the real gamers when they say, "Is D six or D ten? Which one are you going with? <laughs> What's right. your percentages?" Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's get a couple questions in here first before we go any further. We've got one from uh, Tukarin, three fifty four. How do you define the difference of running a professional war game with a homogenous player, same unit, same institution, etc., and with a diverse set of players? Charles, why don't you take that first? Sure. So I'll start with uh, it, I, I don't I don't have a, uh, an immediate answer, but I'll I'll spitball here. So so sure. one thing that we think about is is what roles are the players uh, players taking within the game, and so one example of this is do we have an active red element, an adversary that's taking direct action against blue, versus do we want to just incorporate you know, critical thinking elements, uh, what we call red teaming rather than a red team. And so this is more just kind of internal debate. And so in 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 a red teaming design, what we'll do is we'll often have players all from the same um, uh, organization, let's say. It's, it's rare that we're down to the same unit, <laughs> uh, but the same organization and different elements of the organization come in and and we'll split them up into different groups and then their job is eventually going to be to throw spears at one another 
uh, such that we can still get kind of some critical discourse going on, uh, some 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 polite dissent between different parties in terms of different ideas being thrown together. Um, so so that's kind of at a high level uh, what we look for. One other caveat I'll add on to that before I hand it off to Chris is, is we do always think about our player set and we really think about what assumptions and what key decisions need to be made. And we try to ensure once we've identified key decisions that there is at least one player in the room that uh, even if they aren't making that decision today, they understand all of the elements that go into making that decision. So they've been in that seat in the past or they've sat next to the person making that decision such that we're, uh, uh, we're we're getting enough diversity <laughs> uh, of of thought to to hit what we need out of the game. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there over to Chris. Yeah, I um I totally uh, agree with that, Charles. I for me, it always comes back to the question because uh, we are when we get a gaming project when we started off, there is a question or a set of questions that we are trying to explore, right? And so if uh, if it turns out that the players are all going to be from the same organization if it is a homogenous group of players. Well, what is it that they need to un um, We do actually have one uh, uh, one particular game that's actually one of our crunchier uh, rules heavy, better organized games. It's called the Operational Troop to Task game. And it's actually a manpower staffing game, which will be played by players all in one organization. And it's about how they divvy up you know, roles and missions uh, in order to accomplish a a, uh, a problem, right? And this is something that is very useful for a lot of organizations that are you know doing reorganization or you know facing a new mission set. So that's that's one where it's useful to have people all in the same organization because they know what it is they're supposed to do and what it is they're they're working on. But if you're if we're doing a game that's really about war fighting, you know, if the audience is going to be you know primarily one organization that's one of the benefits of coming to CNA uh, is that we can bring experts, you know, often we will bring a red team, you know, so we will have a, we will bring people to come play as uh, the adversary. So you can say, well, you want to test your plan, right? You can put that into action, but we're going to have, you know, some, some live players here, you know, playing the game opposite you. So you think this is going to work, but they're, they're going to try to stop you. We also like to be able to reach out to other people in the government, uh, we use a green team uh, very often, which is how we account for you know, uh, you know, partner nations and allies. Uh, and so we can reach out to uh, folks in the State Department are very good at that to say like, all right, so you know, you you think you're going to fight a war against uh, you know uh, our adversary, but you know our our ally, which is sitting right there in between us, they're going to have a say as well. Mm -hmm. So how do we get those perspectives you know into uh, into the the equation? So it's it's important when we are designing a game to really analytically think about the problem. What is it that the that that the answer? You know, what kind of data do we need to generate? What are we trying to learn from the game? And then we we work to create the components that are specific to uh, to to get us the the information we want. It's a lot like creating a um, uh, an experiment in a in a laboratory in in some ways, where you have to really think about the different components that you're putting into it to get the results that you need. It's that's a great example. It's like a social political experiment that you're creating and then you're just running on the fly. Now you're talking about red teaming, green teaming and stuff like that. Okay. Red team op four, and then you have green team, which is allies. How much do you have when it comes to these games, how much restriction do you place on both the red team and the green team and, or the green team, as far as following what would be considered the SOP for that nation and how much freelancing are you allowing the players to do as representing those nations? Yeah. Uh, let, let me, let me, let me jump on this real, real quick, Charles, because I actually have a, uh, I've, I've given a lecture uh, on, on this, uh, which you can also find uh, through the, the Georgetown University Wargaming Society page, right. Uh, about, you know, how to use a red team, mm. right. But the same logic applies for a green team. It's like, you know, and again, it comes back to what is the answer that you're looking for? In some games, you might want um, a red that is much more realistic to how it is that your adversary plays. In other times, you might want an adversary who is thinking outside the box because you need to challenge assumptions and you mm -hmm. need to, uh, it, it comes down to, are you trying to evaluate what is the most likely or what is the whole range of possibilities that, that, that could happen? Um, so that's part of the, the, the design process, part of the analysis that goes into, um, 
the pregame analysis that we that we do. Mm -hmm. What do we? What kind of a red team do we want? Do we want them to play more realistic, or do we want someone that's going to come up with ideas out of left field? As here's what they could do. Here's what you might be missing, and here's how we're going to hand you your ass on a plate, mm -hmm. right? Um, so uh, it, it it all depends on the circumstance. Charles, <laughs> your answer was far better than mine, uh, but but just. <laughs> Just, just like the uh, the aspect of we we do tailor our red teams uh, 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 towards different directions based on what we think is most useful to the sponsor. Uh, on the one extreme, you know, the one that's going to hand you your ass on the plate, uh, versus <laughs> uh, on the other extreme, you know, uh, uh, maybe more moderate in terms of thinking or or a little more conservative in terms of play, and and that's part of the assumptions that go into the game too, and that's important to understand. Because ultimately, that is influencing the results of, of the outputs that you get. Uh, so you have to be careful that you don't uh, uh, force an answer out based on those decisions. Yeah, no, that that's a great example or, or, or great point is you don't want too much of your own influence to influence the direction of the game. Because sometimes gamers will, you, know, you see this a lot with uh, deterministic games where you go, okay, as you're playing it, you're like... All right, I can't do this. I can't do that. Okay, I have to follow this path. I have to do this, 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 and this. I'm following right. a path and solving a puzzle. I'm not actually playing a game right. or working the problem. And you want to work the problem. Yeah, especially everything, every problem that we are trying to work with is a real world problem. You know, mm -hmm. there are not, there are not, you know, uh, strict bounds to it. There are always constraints, right? We try to capture those, but, you know, we, we don't want to shoehorn players into making decisions because then we're going to get garbage analysis on the, on the back end. True. I think one of the good analogies or a great way, I should say to describe what you guys do as practitioners would be anybody who's seen Apollo 13, the scene where they have the, uh, the scrubber, they got a, their, the O2 scrubbers are going bad and they said, okay, well, we've got to make this work for this using all of this. And yeah. they, they were taking a real world example and they had limited stuff to work and, and fix the problem. And it was not, um, they, you know, they weren't saying, well, if we did this, we redesign. No, you're not redesigning. You're building something that, that has to be done with only these limited pieces. So uh, you're not going to have too much freelance. Well, there's freelance there, but you got to be creative with just a limited set of tools. Yeah, absolutely. And we got another question here or I should say more of a comment, Robert Crandall says, your time constraints to pro work must be severely restricted. How is it that you both don't have gray hair by now? Your customers are serious, so you have to get it right, more or less, I expect. I, I, I got to lean in a little bit. I am, I'm getting, uh, getting, <laughs> everything is being kind to me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, it can be, uh, it can be strenuous. I did, I, I was crashing. I, I uh, had to uh, execute two war games um, uh, in December before Christmas, uh, you know, so they were, you know, that was, it, it was pretty, pretty intense. <laughs> was it for NORAD tracking a guy in a red suit or what was that? <laughs> was it for NORAD tracking a guy in a red suit? <laughs> yeah, I, I wish <laughs> that'd be a game we would love to run. <laughs> And I had another one here, yeah. Rob Johnson, when you set up games between various teams, how do you engineer yourselves out of it so that your own assumptions or biases don't skew the team actions or the results? That kind of goes back to what we were just talking about or what you guys were just talking about as far as not leading too much, leading the gamers too much with your own uh, direction. You want them to find their own. Yeah, just to add on to that, I, I think one critical aspect is is allowing players some transparency to, to what went into the game and the key assumptions going in so that they can flip the table on you. Uh, and so, it, and there's always, uh, we tell players not to fight the scenario too much, but there's always somebody who's going to say, you know, X, Y, and Z is wrong about this. And, and oftentimes it's really important to get out right at the beginning of a game because it, it helps uh, even if we have to go forward with the scenario and say, all right, we need you to press the I believe button at this point, the it, it helps us frame and, and put those key assumptions uh, into our reports as well. Uh, so we capture those and sometimes it'll actually change the direction. So, all right, we clearly did this wrong. We are we do our best to do due diligence on the research, but but we missed something. How do we fix it now? Do you have a suggestion on how we can move forward with the problem 
but but in a more realistic manner. And so that's that's part of uh, uh, the importance of having the right players in the room that have expertise that you don't have <laughs> uh, so that they can uh, they can correct you and, and call you out uh, uh, when when you miss uh, uh, some of those details. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with uh, I agree with that. I, I would break it down into there's there's uh, for me, there's two distinct ways to, to kind of deal with with that. One is, as Charles said, you know, um, understanding your assumptions that you're putting into the game so that when you're making the analysis on the back end, you know what it is and you can account for that. So an example is a, uh, a few years back, we did a, a, a force structure kind of game. And of course, you, you can't you know, give players the leeway to completely recreate you know, a force with everything imaginable. So you know, we had to put constraints on that. And so the choices were basically like, are you investing more in you know, bombers or fighters for this issue? Are you investing more in, you know, um, you know, uh, it was submarines or surface assets, right? So we, we, we pared it down to some, some decisions that the players could make in the game um, so that we could see what it is they wanted to do and how they, you know, how they, did, they made decisions and how that impacted the outcomes. But we have to take that into account in the analysis on, on the back end as well. The other way that you have to consider it is, as Charles said, with someone who's going to fight the scenario and say like, well, that's not actually how it's going to work. And this is where you know uh, the experience of of being a, a role playing gamer will work. You know, having dungeon mastered you know many games over the years, you know, it's I, I love the tool of being able to step back and say like, well, that's that's an interesting point. Tell me more about that. You're right. Like, so you you've thought about this. How, what what are we missing? Fill in the blanks for me, right? And so instead of having them fight the scenario, you cr turn it around so that they are contributing and adding to the scenario. And so it you know it, you redirect any frustration that might that might occur you know for saying like you guys don't know your stuff well you know you're the professionals in this particular area you you tell me what what did we miss right and we can run with it in in that regard so you have to be able to to flex and uh you know think on your toes well that's one of the things we had talked about backstage is you brought up with the rpg element of things and how you, you can it doesn't matter who the designer is you can come up with a framework of mechanics in the end, one of the things that is the hardest, well, the, the hardest thing to model is a human element because you can roll dice, you can draw cards or whatever to randomize, but in the end, you don't know what's going to happen. Most people are going to probably go with a standard answer. They're going to fall back on what they know. Uh, and then sometimes the person you least expect is going to come out with like this whiz bang answer that you're like, wow, I did not expect that from that person. And that right. is a fantastic solution, which skews the whole thing now real world situation or game and then you're going to have somebody that's going to go off the deep end and totally collapse and again same thing real world or in a game so when it comes to adding in rpg elements what do you lean on as far as doing that aside from just questioning them how do you add that element into the games um so for me i like to uh use scenarios that might be a bit more free form Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, giving giving players a choice and then being able to understand how to, you know, um, either adapt the scenario to to, to what comes next uh, or also just being able to completely think on the fly. Uh, I, I have had the experience where um, I was brought in. It, it was kind of hilarious because I, I was brought in uh, to execute a game that I hadn't designed. Right, because you know, things happened and the people who designed it couldn't be there. Right, so so I went in and so I, I learned how the game was going to work. I learned the, the problem set. Okay, I've got it. I know what you're trying to do with this game. And I went down to the command and I said, "All right, ready to do this." And on the day of, they were like, "No, we're not doing that anymore." I was like, <laughs> "You mean you're not doing that anymore? You've been planning this for months." Um, and they were like, yeah, higher echelon said we, we need to do something else. And I was like, I got to call back to the office for this. I, I don't know. And for the next three days, I had to just be like, you know, wing it, uh, essentially. You know, I kept coming back to the materials we had, we had prepped, but they had a different set of problems and a different set of outcomes that they, that they wanted to get out of. And, I, you know, I just had to facilitate it as best I could. And I... I take it as the uh, you know my, mo my my greatest success of that is that nobody walked out of the war game, you know even though they were people were were very angry. 
<laughs> um, you know, I'm not the one that, 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 that changed it, but we kept people there. So it's the, the, the dealing with the dynamism, um, you know, in, in one way or another, either, either planned or ad hoc, uh, and being able to elicit information from, from people, uh, when they might not even know that they have it is, uh, is an important, uh, aspect of that I get from role-playing games. That's the military for you. Change one to change two to change 3000. That's the reason why the motto is Semper Gumby. You always have to be flexible because you never know what's going to happen, but that is definitely the military and the government all in one nutshell. Yeah. I don't, I don't see that you're surprised by that. No, not at all. <laughs> I expect that it's pretty much the same. What I would expect Charles, your answer. Oh, Oh, just uh, to, to riff off of Chris a little bit, the, uh, uh, I, I attempted to, to be a dungeon master for just a, a short game, uh, a three shot with my family. And um, I, I remember the, the first time I ran it, I, I thought I had all the materials prepped. I knew what I needed to do. And and I, I had my younger brother rolled like three crits in a row for something just absolutely <laughs> insane that he wanted to do. Like completely off topic, off tangent. But but in, in the game, you know, if you roll a crit, you kind of have to let them move forward with whatever route they want to take. Uh, it, it was it was totally unexpected. And so I had to kind of make things up on the fly. But I, I think that core element that, that Chris is getting at and is probably much better than me at, <laughs> uh, to, to pivot rapidly and to be able to kind of think dynamically within your game. You've, you've got a framework and hopefully you've filled it out to at least an 80% solution with the background materials, with the order of battle, with, with everything that you think is going into this problem. So you've got all the pieces but even when the game is actually executing, you may have to change it dynamically because something still didn't work, because something happened that you didn't expect. And the ability to do that, I think, is really critical in order to make sure in, in, in kind of that last stretch that you do hit whatever the sponsor needs from you. So what would you say on average is, and I, and I know that all changes based on the questions you're trying to uh, answer the the solution or not the solution, but the problem you're trying to model. What is the average lead time to to work on a war game to present to uh, whoever the customer is, and then actually designing the game itself? What would you say is your average, and then what would be the longest, and what would be the shortest or fastest designs? I'm not looking for the the game name, but I mean just like it. Oh, I did this one in two hours, or I did this one in two months, that sort of thing. Charles, you first. I, I think the rule of thumb that we go for, uh, and and it varies from game to game based on what the sponsor wants, based on the funding we have, based mm -hmm. on, you know, if, if they want multiple games versus just one big game, you know. So a lot of goes in a lot goes into this, but kind of a rule of thumb is for a standard game, we're looking at three months lead up uh, or more if we can get it. <laughs> and then uh, at least three months after the game executes to write up their report, do the analysis. Uh, and, and produce the the final results uh, that, that the sponsor is interested in. Um, so if we're looking at anything less than that, we're we're starting to I, I, to go back to one of our earlier discussions. We're starting to pour pull more heavily from previous games, things that are already kind of built out uh, that we can kind of quickly slap together, uh, such that we can do something if it's kind of an urgent request uh, and, and still respond to urgent. <laughs> Uh, sponsor yeah. demands, but but the quality there's a trade off there, uh, and so that that that's, that's where it gets challenging, and you just kind of have to to discuss with with whoever's asking for the product. Chris? Yeah, I, I think that's about right. I think our our standard now is we're we're you know, waiting for about six months uh, between like the start of a of, of a project to executing the game, but I think that's that's a factor of our calendar being being so busy, you know, as as well. Um, but I think the the actual if we get to focus primarily on one project instead of seven you know at a time you know uh, three three months you know about to to do it but it does vary a lot based on on the the sponsor need and there have been instances where um, there are you know, emergent crises um, we we for example did uh, did some of the gaming um, you know uh, prior uh, to the um, uh, vaccine rollout you know, for the, you know, uh, during mm -hmm. the pandemic, right? Um, and it was you know, working in collaboration with someone else who had done a lot of the game design, but, but you know, that was, there's, it's a real world crisis, real things are mm -hmm. happening, there's just not the time. So you have to move, move quickly. So um, there is the opportunity to, to move fast, 
you know, when, uh, when, when we have to, because we're in the national security business, you know, our, our mm -hmm. job is fundamentally to help the nation be more secure. And so we have to be responsive in that way. Uh, but, you know, given our druthers day to day, we <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's where I, where I was going to go next was I was going to say, OK, in the happy world, it's six months, three pre three post that sort of thing. So technically two per year or one every six months, you know, however you want to break it down. But it's actually not one. It's four five, six, seven, eight, whatever yeah. it depends. They're all going to go concurrently. <laughs> but then at the same time. What do you do when uh, a massive event happens? You know, whether it is um, like we're saying the pandemic or if it was uh, a massive uh, power outage on the East Coast that this is going to be this is going to last several days. How do you war game something like that? And then do you have things that you keep on the shelf that you basically can just, well, we can use this because this is the framework we always use and we can just tweak some modification or make some modifications, tweak some variables and we can utilize this to try to answer the questions that we have right now. Uh, how quick do you, like with the pandemic, how fast did you spin something up like that for um, working through different problems and how many times did you have to tweak it to answer different questions? Yeah, so hopefully by the time a, a crisis happens, it's already been gamed because it's mm -hmm. usually it's usually too late by that point to, to really do a war game and and try to try to learn something. But, um, you know, for for the pandemic, I know it was, there was another organization that had a, a a game structure. One of our facilitators jumped in to to do that to work with the government, you know, to walk through. It's like, all right, tell us the plans. Let's let's stress test the plan. Let's find out what we did not think about, you know, um, for you know, uh, you know, for executing this this issue. Mm -hmm. Charles. On, on my end, I, I, I've been lucky that I haven't had to execute anything that sounded like it was going to be a, an urgent request. Uh, <laughs> normally, the, the sponsor uh, uh, in, in follow on discussions, you know, here's option A, here's option B. Uh, the sponsor has been willing to shift and, and, and let things go a little bit longer. Uh, but um, uh, typically, there are kind of two components to the strategy. So one is I have a, a very kind of top down approach to, to designing games where I just focus on what do they really need to know? Uh, what is what are the key sponsor questions? What can a war game do to help address those questions? Uh, and then from there, what data do I need to to answer whatever the war game or pull out? What data do I need from the war game to hit those points, which help address the sponsor questions? And once I get to that point, I can at least have a facilitated conversation. It won't be particularly pretty. It may just be you know filling in you know quad charts or sheets, and that's actually. Uh, uh, we had some of those for for um, uh, during COVID, uh, just because that that was the the best way to get the data for the sponsor. It was a lot less fun from a playing experience. Um, the uh, uh, and and so 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 there's kind of that that minimum criteria just to get the data you need. But then there's the extra elements you want to layer on to kind of add to the player experience. Uh, you know, and enrich the background material. I uh, uh, build out all the, the pieces and parts that, that just make the experience a little more interesting and fun and appealing uh, to everybody involved. So that's the, those are kind of the trade-offs I often present. And, and usually, uh, uh, um, at, at least so far, I've been lucky that uh, the decision has been uh, quality over, over speed <laughs> uh, for, mm -hmm. for the situations I've been in. Well, I got a question now for just general wargaming itself when it comes to DOD. How often, I know that primarily you're going to be dealing with like, I guess, strategic more so than operational in a lot of these war games because you're going like high level, high level command, things like that. How often do they, does DOD want to switch it up where they put people in different positions than, than they normal are, normally are so that way they can start to look at what the other jobs do and they think outside the box as well. So that way they get that cross training and that, oh, wow, I'm totally out of my comfort zone here. How do I do this? <laughs> you know, because I think that is a really good tool as far as having people um, learn different things. I don't know how often they'll do that at the higher command levels like that, but uh, how often do you see that, if ever? That's a so, good. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, so I'll say that just just by attending a war game, even if you show up and you're playing the role that that you normally sit in, 
you're going to naturally have conversations, especially for in-person games. Uh, virtual games are a little more complicated. Uh, but for in-person mm -hmm. games, you're going to have tabletop conversations. You're going to be interacting with people in those other seats. And, and it's a great learning environment uh, where you can still kind of sit in your own area of expertise and, and be comfortable there on the decisions you're making, which is important for us as game designers uh, to make sure that, that we're getting accurate, semi-accurate decisions most of the time. Um, and uh, uh, but they still get to see other points of view. And so I'd, I'd say that that happens in the vast majority of games we run. Um, the one uh, uh, there, there's an exception to rules. <laughs> and so I, I'm currently looking at a game where we're looking at at um, uh, rather than incremental solutions, very innovative solutions. And I have to speak pretty broadly about this, but but we don't want people giving the standard answers to something you said earlier, Mo. Uh, and, and so we're actually looking at putting people who aren't typically in those seats into mm -hmm. the war game and seeing if that'll get us some really creative solutions to problems. Uh, and, and so it's, it's an ongoing discussion. Well, whether we'll actually follow through with that. Uh, but, but that's an example where we may be thinking about uh, doing the opposite. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think what your your proposal uh, is, Mo, is interesting, and it could yield interesting results for for a particular game if you know, to to fit in the, in the uh, to to resolve a particular problem. I'm, I'm actually going to like keep that in my pocket as like something to. to I don't do, know right? if it would resolve a problem or if it would just be more of an experimentation. Well, <laughs> it, it is, but there's you know there it, it it depends what the question is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what we do see a lot in the game usually. As Charles said, we, we want to have people who are familiar with the position that they're playing so mm -hmm. that they can make realistic decisions. But a lot of times we're asking people to play up, right? So we'll get mm -hmm. we'll get 04s and ask them to make 06 decisions. We're getting 06s and asking them to to make, you know, uh, you know, 09 decisions or you know, national command authority decisions. Sure. Right. So we have to give create the the scenario to give them the comfort and empower them. Right. Uh, but they're, it's usually rooted in in what their experience is. But typically they're playing something that's a little different from what they're what they're used to uh, playing in one way or another. But I can't think of an example where we've actually kind of switched them up to be like, you usually you know, do this. Now you're going to yeah. play on on on, on this uh, unless we're you know playing with something with adversaries. But usually mm -hmm. it comes out in the discussion around the game. But it's interesting. Yeah. I think that would be kind of almost like a field training exercise type of environment. It's like, okay, the talk just got hit. We lost our, we lost our XO, we lost our CO, whatever. Uh, you are now in command, you know, and you take the next yeah. captain or whatever and say, you, you're now running as a Colonel, you know, you're running what the Colonel would do and you move everybody up in the chain of command, you know, so oh, yeah. everybody's got to step up and wow, I didn't think of this before. It, Cause this could also kind of tie into one of the other issues that I think really always is a question in the military and that's commander's intent. Mm -hmm. What the highest level command, like what national command authority wants, does it get conveyed down? Have you ever done a game like that where kind of like, it's almost like telephone in a way where it's like, okay, we're going to start off here. This is what the president wants. And then it goes through the JCS and it goes all the way down through all different branches. And then have you ever looked and analyzed what is each branch? How do they come up with it. what's the answer by the time it gets to the bottom what the commander's intent is how has it been changed warped or bastardized into something that is the same or completely different than what was intentionally or initially set out mo that doesn't happen we're completely joint now everything is of course, <laughs> of course. everybody i bet you they say word for word what the commander wanted <laughs> exactly. No, again, inter interesting idea. I don't think I've ever, I, I don't think I've seen that. Giving you guys all these great ideas. Yeah. Along those, those lines. The, the closest I can think of is, is I was looking at a C2 game and, and one of the, the uh, challenges we were thinking about is, is whether you, you kind of are the trade-offs between centralizing or decentralizing uh, your authorities and, and, and who's in charge. And so the, uh, um, and, and so there's, when you look at kind of the the, the cons to, to decentralized authority is you may have the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing or vice versa, uh, or, or they're, they've both been kind of given their independent, you know, uh, rules of engagement. You know, if, if you're here and you see X, Y, and Z take action, 
you over here, you know, if you see A, B, and C do action, um, and, and then you have to live with the results of that. The, the game, unfortunately, didn't manifest the way I, I wanted it to, <laughs> uh, so we, we really couldn't test mm. it. But it was it was very I was very kind of aware that that could happen and wanted to at least uh, get some discussion from the players about that as it was happening, uh, but never really got to good mechanics on on how to drive that further. So, over. Yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to experiment or investigate that a little further because you get the initial order comes down and then it, how it's interpreted by each level beneath that, and then when it gets down to the ground level, the guys who are going to do it gets down a company platoon level just to see how it gets disseminated down amongst the different services and what is the, um, how does the, each level of command interpret, pass it on, and how does that affect rules of engagement, uh, decision-making process for at each level below that? Because our guy's going to be like, ah, I'm going to be a little more risk averse here because I don't want to take the chance from what the commander's saying here. It, it, it's a little vague because this could actually be a good way to, war game out communication yeah so mm -hmm. let me let me take this into a very uh, it's going to be like very prosaic but i think this is the right audience to like talk about like, <laughs> like very nerdy factors you know, nice. of, of game 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 constraint here right so uh so it's an interesting it, it's an interesting concept um and i'm and i was sitting here thinking like how would we execute that so a lot of people when when they hear we're doing we do war gaming for department of defense they think that we are doing you know, uh, computers, right? Computer wargaming, mm -hmm. but everything we do is pretty much tabletop in one way or another, right? It's role playing, or it's you know maps and counters and pieces. You know, uh, we work CNA works in the analog space for for doing our games, right? So I'm thinking about a C2 game like this, and the first thing that comes to my mind is that requires a lot of space, right? So if you have if you have like someone making a decision and it disseminates out to different teams. That means that those teams have to be arranged so that they do not communicate with each other. So they, at the very least, need to have different tables at different parts of a large room, or even better, different rooms, you know, uh, separated out. If you're getting, you know, a large conference room, you know, uh, you would be surprised how how much of a premium gets put on DoD real estate, you know, uh, office space, right? To get a large conference room is going to limit you uh, a lot into like when you can execute. And to get multiple rooms at a command means that that question has to be very, very, very important to that command to displace a lot of people to get that space. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a command that really what they need to study is why their C2 is so jacked up. <laughs> yeah. It has to be a, a very big, a very big problem. I think conceptually that is that is fascinating, but it very quickly runs up against the physical space, you know, constraint that that we deal with on a a day to day basis, where you know we have to sit down and say, all right, you know, uh, hey, find find us when when is when is the conference room available, and that's when we're going to be able to do the date. And yeah. more often than not, like the games we design have to be constrained by yeah. when they can get the big conference room. <laughs> right? That would be better off for like a connections online type of situation where you can say, yeah. here's the Discord servers. Not server, servers, and everybody. This team's in this server. This team's in this server, and then you have the neutral server where whoever needs to be in there, they can go where the moderators are. The moderators can go to all the servers, but they're compartmentalized enough to where they can't get into each other's servers. The communication is all within their own group, and then it gets just disseminated down, or maybe crossed from one server to the other. And right. you know that's where the separation is of command, uh, and then see how it all breaks down, how or how it filters down. Uh, it would just be curious, I think, to see because yeah. how many times have you heard a rumor or anything at work or elsewhere? Oh, oh yeah. did you hear about so and so? This happened. It's like, well, by the time you find out, it's like it was nothing. What that was nothing at all. What happened? But yeah. by the time well, it got yeah. down to you, it's totally changed. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you you know that you know the term rumint, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. intelligence, you know, sig yep. signals intelligence. Rumint yep. is rumors intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And rumint is a Scuttlebutt. real thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. I mean, rumor control, yeah. as we always used to call it, we'd say rumor control has it that boom, you know, whatever. <laughs> and it's it's true. And so many rumors, you know, they start with they may start with a nugget of truth or just a nugget of wish. It's like, hey, uh, we're getting a 96 this weekend, right? <laughs> 
plant the seed. Maybe we will. You're never going to do that, but you got to try. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? So that that's one way of doing it. So I, I got another question in here. This is uh, Tukarin again. On sponsored game, as far as I know, is that the end result is decided prior. Uh, so how do you run the game knowing how the game should end while maximizing the learning process for the players? I think we kind of already did touch on that earlier, uh, unless you have anything else that you'd like to add to that. But I think there's an important clarification to make here, and, and that's that, that CNA is an independent organization. So we can actually, even if we're, we're, we feel our sponsor is kind of forcing our hand one direction, we can say no to that, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which there, there's some risk that comes with that. So we have to be diplomatic about those those decisions, but but we ultimately can do that. And so it, it's important to distinguish the objective from the end result, right? So there's there's end products, the, the kind of results from the analysis that we produce, which will be based on whatever the players decide within the war game. And we're going to try to, to make them free to, to make whatever decisions they make. And, and so the, that's, that should inform what the sponsor cares about. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But, but it may not be what the sponsor wants to hear necessarily. So I'll, I'll just, hopefully that, that clarification is useful. And, and Chris, over to you, if you want to add anything there. Yeah, I think that that is a, a key distinction between when when the military does games, you know, anyone who's been in you know uh, a, a military exercise knows that there there are measles, like there there are things that you that you have to do, wickets that you have to get through in order to get mm -hmm. to the game, right? And then you get to the end, and it, it's prescripted. That is not what happens with a CNA game. Um, you know, a lot of time people ask us, "Well, what are your measles?" We're like, "We we don't do that, right? We we have a completely different experience because we are looking to." to ask those questions that are unbounded, unsquishy, we get to that un, un, uncertain space that the military themselves can't really get to. The mm -hmm. other part of that question that Charles hinted at, you know, CNA is an outside organization, but specifically we are a federally funded research and development center. This is a very particular kind of uh, uh, nonprofit organization. FFRDCs uh, are, uh, there's like 36 of them. Each one has been created by Congress. Each one has to serve a particular federal uh, executive branch agency. We get funding in the federal budget, but we have to be housed in a nonprofit research organization, right? So these are some of the rules that guide us. But what that means is that whether or not our sponsor likes the answer, we're getting money from Congress next year to help you with more projects. And, you know, as I said, I've, I've been at CNA a little bit longer than Charles. I've been here 14 years. I love nothing better than telling your sponsor, <laughs> we don't do that. Or no, uh, that is not what we're going to say. You know, I've had sponsors say, eh, we don't like this finding. Can you take that out? And I say, no. <laughs> like, like th this is what we found in the game. And I'm sorry you don't like it. Maybe we can say it a little bit more diplomatically. But, like, we're not, we're not going to not say that because – that is your main problem and that is what you need to address right um so, yeah, that... so I, we we have academic independence while being you know in the tent with the with the military and it, we, we kind of lean into that a lot how often do you find resistance in that regard versus acceptance and hey thanks for pointing that out to us because i would i would think but then again i i guess i think differently if you found a flaw in our way, I'd be like, really? Did you really find a flaw? Okay, show it to me. Where was the flaw? Was it your misinterpretation or something we're doing wrong? Because that can happen. So you just want to verify. Yeah. And then when it's proved, no, there's a flaw in what you guys are doing in your process, your response, whatever, you go, okay, wow, thanks. Now we can work on fixing that. Not, no, we don't want that negative thing. No, I want the negative things. The more you, yeah. you know, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. That's the way you should always approach those things is you want right. to correct your shortcomings in simulation rather than have to do it in real world. Right. And that that's 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 usually the approach where we we get into the rub is when we are writing a report um, that's going to someone's boss yeah. <laughs> and they, they've looked at it first and they're like, you know, I don't like the way that you said that. And we're like, yeah, but you didn't do the thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, we can't say that you did the thing when you didn't do the thing. Right. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's tension you know, there sometimes, but you know, that we, since we are not, we are not your typical contractors, 
we don't have to do what the government says. We we get mm -hmm. paid to give the answers that the government needs to hear. Sure. So now that we've talked all about the practitioner, the professional side, let's talk a little bit about the hobby side. And, you know, we talked about the diversions. Now, where do you see the two kind of connecting and no pun intended to connections, but uh, how you have that crossover between the hobby and the commercial or the commercial space and in the professional space, where do you see the crossover? Where do you see where uh, practitioners can benefit from more experience with hobby games and dealing, you know, talking with hobby gamers and how can hobby gamers contribute more into the professional space? Yeah. Charles, you want to take that one first? Yeah, I was going to say, Charles, take that first. <laughs> sure. So I, I think actually I'll, I'll jump back to something that Chris said earlier, which is one of the things we do at CNA is, is we regularly take time to look at commercial games and, and part of it is, is kind of just enjoying playing the game, but then another component Ed, that we do to kind of wrap up playing the game is we we dissect it a little bit and say and talk about what we liked about the game, what we didn't like, particularly from a mechanic side, uh, such that we can um, uh, such we can think about how we might incorporate that into future war games. And so the um, uh, one we were doing recently, it was it was this art game. I, I wrote down the name earlier, and I don't know if I can find it yet. Canvas. That was it. We were playing a game called Canvas, which was really cool, uh, where, where you're just making artwork. But but the idea is that you're laying different, overlaying different transparencies of different images on top of one another. And I really liked the idea of taking transparencies and, and thinking about that from a, a fog of war perspective. So if you've got red to, red in one room, green in another, and the, or, or green in another and blue in a third, and they all are kind of writing out, you know, here's where our forces are going to be, but we don't know where the adversary really is. Uh, or, or we may not even have perfect information about our allies, you know. Uh, and and so then you overlay all the transparencies on top of one another, and you see, oh, <laughs> there, there's there's clearly going to be a conflict right here because you both bumped into each other in another location. You just kind of ran off in a different direction where there's nothing going on. And so I, I don't know whether that will ever be useful, but hmm. but we try to do things like that where we draw from from uh, draw inspiration uh, from from commercial games. Yeah, we um, we definitely do that. And uh, we lean into the belief that if you're going to design games, you need to play games and you need to understand games. So we we look at them analytically and I'm sure, you know, you know everyone in, in, you know, who's in the chat and listening to this, if you're enough of a nerd to be here with us, you know, uh, on, a, on a Friday night, you have dissected the mechanics of, of, a, of a war game. <laughs> Right. And we do the same thing. And you and, you know, many of you have probably also designed games yourselves in the in the in the hobby space. It might not be published, but you've I'm sure you've tinkered with it. You say, like, well, I'm going to take this this element here and here and I'm going to do a cool new thing. Right. And that's that's what we do. And we can be better game designers if we you know understand everything that's out there. So a couple of examples, one uh, about let's see, about three weeks ago. At our, you know, we have every two weeks we've got a training session where we play a different kind, a different game, uh, and then we we get the experience of playing. We pick it apart for like what are the mechanics and how do we understand that? And as Charles was saying, what are what are some things that kind of appeal to us that we might be able to use in the future? So we played um, uh, War Room. We broke out the, the the big box, you know. So Larry Harris Jr.'s you know most recent you know uh, War Room, and we got to the combat adjudication. And and I t I turned to our lead war game designer and I was like I was like shit Jeremy it was like I should I should have played this last year because because this is the combat resolution mechanic that I was going for and I came up with something that was kind of like it but not nearly as good <laughs> and, and you spent how many hours trying to like yeah, own it you exactly know? and each of those is a billable hour to the government so I can't like spend as much time as as Larry Harris Jr has done since you. Know, since he developed Axis and Allies in what what was it 19, 1980, right? Yeah. And he's developed this, and it came out in the war in War Room. And I was like, this is just so much better. But like, I could have completely cribbed this, you know, for what we were trying to do in that game, and it would have been a bit more elegant. We would have had like better effects. We could have spent less time because each of those games got bogged down in the combat resolution, right? And and we we wasted time there. We could have like moved on to to the other stuff, right? But I was like, 
I, I have learned from this and I, I can, I can, you know, jump on that. Right. So that's something that we, that we could do. Also, similarly, as I was telling you in the, uh, uh, I think, uh, backstage that we, uh, at the beginning of this week, we had one of our game designers run a sessions of Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. for, uh, for a group of our analysts who have never played Dungeons and Dragons before. And, you know, if you, if you have not played Dungeons and Dragons, right, that's a, that is a key, that is a key game, right? All right. So you need to like know how it works. You need to know what goes into it. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do in terms of facilitation and getting, you know, people to make decisions and bring, you know, having them apply those decisions to the table, those are skills that you can develop by playing, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. So, you know, we need to hit these, these major wickets and we need to have exposure to them. There is a lot that we can learn from uh, the, the hobby realm because at the end of the day, game design is game design. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we need to know what, what the building blocks are. Uh, we have a copy of Jeff Engelstein's, um, you know, elements of uh, tabletop, elements of tabletop, uh, game design, you know, sitting in our library mm -hmm. at work and we can reference that and like pull that out. Yeah, no, that's great. It, it, that's a great point. And one of the things you were talking about with uh, playing D and D, I think it would be really good to not only run everybody through D and D, but also have them run as a uh, game as a GM. So, or DM, yeah. so that way they can understand prepping beforehand. And then the number one rule of, of tabletop role playing is let, the players develop the story. You're not there to, to, to break them and kill them off. You're there to throw challenges at, in front of them, obstacles to let them overcome them, let them develop their own story. So that, that would be a great thing, especially when it comes back to the human element thing we were talking about before. You can learn how to utilize that DM experience into your own war games when dealing with people. Yeah, absolutely. So from a commercial standpoint or the, the hobby standpoint, how can hobbyists themselves how could they get involved in the professional space uh, at all uh, or can they even get it and get involved and if they did how could they get involved and what could they do and what do you think they would help bring to that space mm. good question yeah very good question <laughs> Uh, Charles, you want to take this one too? <laughs> sure. You, you notice Charles, he's like, I don't know here. It's all on you, man. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I actually got this question at a, a podcast a couple months ago now, and, and it, it, it's a struggle, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of entry barriers to, to doing professional war games. Um, I, I think some things that you could try would include, uh, don't necessarily look at DOD games, right? Because I'll, you'll hit classification barriers you'll hit uh, uh just just kind of confidential information or or, or not even uh confidential but but um uh, uh um uh, uh I'm, I'm thinking i'm forgetting the word but but essentially like non-disclosure non-disclosure act mm -hmm. issues uh and so what you might want to look at instead is is maybe kind of disaster response or crisis response sort of events because there are other uh, um, organizations that run war games, uh, not just for the DOD, but but organizations that will um, uh, uh, look at you know responses to pandemics like COVID. Uh, I, I remember there was one. Um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the, there was a war game that that essentially like ran a a COVID like pandemic game with a whole bunch of lessons learned about two years before COVID came out. Um, uh, let's see. There are occasionally uh, war games that are are more forward facing. Uh, mm -hmm. If they want to try to just get kind of novel results or ideas and kind of crowdsource the information, uh, I recall that uh, I wrote down somebody who did. Uh, I think CNAS uh, did one a few years back. I don't know if they still do that regularly. Um, so you can, if you just want to kind of see what those are, uh, you can you can hunt down uh, that example. You can hunt down other examples. And so that that'll give you exposure to it as a starting point. Um, the uh, from there, I'm I'm not sure what the next steps would be because there's no you can't go out and get a degree in wargaming that I know of. <laughs> and so Darn. it's yeah right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so uh, it's there's there's no clear <clears throat> path. You you may have to just make your own way in it from there. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, over to you though. Yeah. So uh, to to tack on immediately on that, there are. Um, some uh, some offerings at universities, right? I know um, you know uh, King's College in London has a whole 
uh, section for uh, for wargaming, you know, in their national security division. I forget what it's uh, specifically. What, it's <laughs> what is that? I stand corrected. Carry yeah, on. yeah. So, um, but I don't think you get a degree in wargaming, right? But that you can <laughs> specialize in that. Um, and Sebastian Bay, who's going to be talking to you uh, later in, in the conference, he's a colleague of ours. He's also a professor at Georgetown, and he teaches a game on war game design at Georgetown, and that is helping to teach, uh, you know, uh, graduate students, people who are young in their career to, you know, about war gaming and how to both design games and then how to use war games in their professional space, because Georgetown feeds a lot into the, the national security uh, industry. Sure. Um, so that, that's like kind of the educational space. Professionally, there is a uh, another uh, gaming conference that has been around for a while. It's called Connections. People have have uh, referenced it um, in in the chat I've seen, and that is the Professional Wargaming Conference. To give you a sense of how big the professional wargaming industry is, you know this conference is well attended by about two hundred people. You know every year, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And it alternates. It sounds between, like a war game convention, two or 300 people. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and it alternates between the, uh, you know, somewhere in the National, National Defense University in, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. or somewhere around Washington, D.C., uh, the National Capital Area, or somewhere else, right? Um, so there's an opportunity to attend in person if you have the opportunity to get there. Um, but on the other hand, I would say if you're, if the question is, how can, hobby war gamers kind of contribute to professional war gaming mm -hmm. there there are so many war games out there that look at like real world conflict right and and the, the future war games and people you you can read the 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 headlines and people know that the united states you know we're preparing you know for uh that that the the china is a pacing threat Right, that, that mm -hmm. people are, are looking at the potential of, of a, a, a war over Taiwan. Uh, everyone is trying to avoid this, right? But but this is a major crisis. You know, a, a potential conflict with Iran or North Korea. These are things that are well known. Um, you know, uh, Russia is very busy in Ukraine, uh, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be another conflict somewhere else, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you can look at the headlines. You can pay attention to what's going on in the real world. And there are games that are designed to to play those out from the from the hobby space, and uh, you know there is a lot of information in Jane's. You know, there's a lot of pretty decent information on Wikipedia that is a good start if people design their own games or mod games that they play, take a rule set and create something else. And the the one of the advantages that hobby gaming can provide over the gaming that we do at CNA is just getting in the reps and sets and doing, mm -hmm. doing the same game over and over and over. Like I can go out on the internet and find a, a data set for diplomacy and see thousands of plays of diplomacy and find all these different strategies that work for playing diplomacy. Right. Um, uh, because people have done that a lot. They've collected information on it. They've put it out there because nerds like to play games and nerds like to share data about the game, mm -hmm. right? And and we we love that too. So if someone wanted to contribute to professional wargaming, hey, play hobby games that are on relevant topics, create a bunch of data, and then someone can tap into that, right? And that get that is not going to give a set answer, but it mm -hmm. gives a a base set of data of of something that you can look at. Sure. Yeah. I was just trying to figure out how, um, I mean, and that's, that's a good, good piece of information there is, is how could we take the experience, the knowledge, the passion of hobby gamers and, and those who wanted to, how could they help in the professional right. space? Because and I look at it and go, okay, you guys got to, you have these crunches where you're working through these games and you're coming up with, um, you know, these different models that you're going to have to work on based on the, the, the problem you're trying to, solve or the questions you're trying to answer well war gamers are constantly playing games well i don't know it wouldn't be that easy to hand out a game to somebody say test this for me because there's you know, all the nda stuff and everything else but yeah. why not if we've got that knowledge that passion that experience and everything why not tap into it you know and yeah. see what could be could be drawn from it because 
I know that they're different. They, they do diverge as to how they work and what the, what the, uh, end result is supposed to, what they're going for. But I still think that there's something that hobby gamers can contribute to the professional space because uh, everybody that throws in an idea, you never know. It could be something completely outside of what you guys do, you know, and because we're thinking of it from the hobby aspect. We go, Oh yeah, I've seen this quirky thing in one other game. And I think this is, uh, this was a pretty cool solution to this. And you're like, wow, I never thought of that, you know, because there is more exposure to hobby, hobby games versus the pro games. Yeah, no. So, so to riff on that even a little bit more, um, so if you have read headlines recently, uh, there's a think tank, um, in Washington, DC, CSIS, um, center for, what does it stand for? Center for strategic and international studies, maybe. Right. Mm-hmm. And they received a grant from, uh, the Smith Richardson foundation. They, uh, have been, you know, getting some press recently. It was on CNN and a bunch of other media outlets that they they ran a a war game that was completely you know unclassified you know looking at a war um, between the United States and China over over Taiwan mm-hmm. right and they put some results out there of the games and they played the game twenty four times that they they developed and hobby gamers can can get numbers well beyond that and can get mm-hmm. creativity well beyond that right um, you know uh, hobby gamers can can go out create orders of battle you know from from all sides and you know play that and and explore that space and get well more than 24 you know examples out there and you know post it on discord on mm-hmm. on reddit or, or or somewhere and just see see what happens and you know it's not going to be the the same level of analysis that you get from a professional sure you know, Department of Defense game, but it's something and mm-hmm. people are going to notice, right? It's going to mm-hmm. be interesting and, you know, available makes it available for professional analysts to look at and, you know, understand the assumptions and whatnot. I, we, we've just talked about how we look to hobby games for, you know, how, how things can be done. And we look to, to the hobby gaming industry to see, you know, how, how can be, you know, what, what can we learn? So, you know, there, there are, there are ways to, to game out problems that we are looking at in very specific ways, but what we don't get usually is the, the, the numbers to, to play it repeatedly. Right. True. True. Yeah. You know, it kind of goes back to one of the things, uh, one of the, one of my other interests is astronomy and backyard astronomers. We can yeah. actually do a lot when it comes to contributing to real science because you can, we can throw our telescope out there and look at anywhere in the sky that we want. Whereas the professional astronomer has to put in applications and request time on scopes. And they don't have that freedom that we do, all of us do, if we just want to take our scope out in the yard. So that's where the amateur can actually have a direct and major impact to the, uh, the, the professional astronomer. So I was thinking about, is there a way that we can have hobby war gamers kind of contribute in that regard? And it, it pretty similar, you know, just creating yeah. data sets and, and, and providing those uh, for you guys to utilize and maybe run with and say, oh, yeah, this is good or no, this is garbage, you know, whatever. Right. And then you start looking at who these people are that are contributing and you go, no, that person's stuff is usually pretty good. So I know I can trust that, you know, data pretty good. I'll, I'll still check it, but I know they're generally pretty good. This guy's a hoople head. No, <laughs> stuff's right. out of here. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's, that's where analysis comes in. Yeah, you know, sure. Of course, once you, once you put, you know, analysis out there in the open space, it's there for everyone. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's, <laughs> there's limits for that as well. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and everybody's an expert. <laughs> yep. So, um, what was I going to say? The, oh yeah. I just noticed you put a private chat in there, Chris. <laughs> oh yeah. I was answering the question because I was yeah. just yeah, saying, I was like, I was like, it oh, didn't... Mo was already on that. Mo answered that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, unfortunately, you guys can't put in the into the chat yourselves. But I do want to say we're going to wrap this up here in a few more minutes. And I just wanted to put a last call out if anybody had any questions from the audience. Uh, you guys have been really great as far as not uh, slamming us with a bunch of questions. You've had some really good ones tonight. And uh, I really do appreciate you guys' cooperation in that regard. And also coming up with some great questions. I know. Charles and Chris are both enjoying that. Uh, I know Chris keeps just 
stiff arming it to Charles. <laughs> I don't want to answer that. You answer that, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm I need to think about that because I, I talk too much. I know I talk. I, I I I will I will dominate the conversation. I want to talk too much, so I throw it to Charles and give him a chance to. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Chris is taking time to collect his thoughts, so he's a much more eloquent answer than me. That's what's going on. Uh, <laughs> but when it comes to um, hobby games, again, going back to hobby war games, you guys uh, don't have a lot of time with the hobby war games. What would it take to get you more into trying out a hobby war game? Would it be needing to get with a group of people? I don't know, like at a online convention that are going to run demos to teach you how to play a game or just in person, you know, you, you know, it's, um, uh, find me a, a babysitter and get my wife a spa day. Right? There you go. <laughs> That's a good plan. That's you know, a good as, plan. <laughs> you know, I, and I, 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 every opportunity I get to play games, I do. Um, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, last, I, I told you, I, I had to execute a couple of games in December. So when I was crashing, I, I came in on the weekend and there was one day where I was just like, it was one weekend I came in. I was like, I just don't have the energy to do my work. And I have to walk through the library at, at CNA to, to get to my office. And our library is well stocked with war games. And I, I was like, I'm just going to solo Shores of Tripoli. Right. <laughs> like, I just I, I have to do that today and it's worth it. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I just, I, you know, and um, so if, if I can, if I can get away, if I can get some quiet time to my, to my, to myself, um, you know, I, I, I will play games and if I can get a, a war game on the table, I know that's where I need to, to, to practice and learn some more. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there. So I would love to play, you know, more, more war games. However, I will say that, my my laptop is not strong enough to uh to support vassal or tabletop simulator wow how yeah. old is your laptop <laughs> dude i am so disappointed because i bought it in 2019 really right? yeah oh, okay. and it just doesn't have the video i don't i don't know it's it, it was a whole disappointment for for covid when everyone else went mm. like digital uh playing games online yeah. i just could not join in the reindeer games wow <laughs> damn <laughs> oh. so Mm, yeah. That's tough. Charles, yeah, you? Yeah, uh, it's a similar answer to Chris with the uh, babysitter and, and spa day issue. Uh, but but those aside, I, I think there is an element um, of, of wanting somebody in the room who actually knows kind of what the real tactics are supposed to look like with these games. I remember when I was playing, um, I, I, I used to play a video game, uh, XCOM, which is mm -hmm. uh, you're like a special ops team and you're going after aliens. It's super fun. And so aliens are landing everywhere and, and you go in and it, and then it's just kind of this like, you know, <laughs> a, a, a platoon or so, or maybe a squad of, of like highly specialized units uh, that, that are like handling corners and buildings. And you're looking at lines of sight to like shoot down the aliens mm -hmm. before they come after you. And, and a, a friend of mine pointed out, you know, if, if you actually use like military tactics, you do a lot better in the game <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and in terms of like breaking and entering and, and, you know, some of those protocols. And so uh, I, I remember thinking that and, 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 you know, the idea of applying that to, to war games, I'd, I'd like to be able to, to kind of know what you're supposed to do uh, in mm. terms of, you know, if you're playing squad leader or, or, you know, uh, playing a game, uh, uh, Napoleon's Waterloo campaign, you know, mm what was the right tactics for that time for those units? Um, and so having an expert in the room to, to talk me through that would be kind of an additional bonus uh, for all of that. So. Hmm. Yeah, that, that would be good. You can get that either with a hobby war gamer or with uh, you know, one of the guys, if, if you're near the crew lack center or something like that, get, get over there with the, you know, you had worked with them in the past, the, the Marine uh, war fighting, I think you said, Chris, mm -hmm. or was that you, Charles? That was me. <laughs> that was you. Okay. Yeah. So you had worked with them in the past. So you probably have some contacts over there that you can work with that would be able to hook you up and for just that, you know, to kind of walk you through more of the, the proper tactics. But really when you think about it, military tactics, especially tactical movement and things like that is really not super high speed, low drag. It's, it's really a lot of common sense when you think about it, <laughs> you know, if, if you want to move, you want to move with overwatch. You don't just want to, 
bundle, mm-hmm. you know, just stumble into an area. You want to have somebody watching your back say, that way, oh, I got to get back, you know, and you step back because you just stepped into a, you know, a hornet's nest. You get, you get covering fire while you kind of drop back. So a lot of that stuff, like I said, is really more common sense than it is anything else. But for the uninitiated, it seems like it's some sort of black magic and kind of weird, but uh, it's, it's not that bad. I think if you get somebody from, um, you know, over there that can help you out. I think that would help you uh, be able to jump into and here's uh, be able to jump in and get more out of the games. And Captain Darwin's saying kind of similar. What types of hobby games, computer or tabletop would you play if you had the time? So if you got a month worth of spa days and babysitters, what would you guys play? Oh, man. So, <laughs> the possibilities. Uh, the possibilities are limitless, yeah. right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a big tabletop role-playing guy. Uh, my favorite game uh, system at, at the moment for the past few years is uh, Blades in the Dark and the whole Forged in the Dark uh, gaming system. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really great system for telling stories and... <laughs> Uh, the, the Blades in the Dark scenario is really very interesting and fun. Uh, if anyone is not familiar with it, it, it is a, essentially a um, it's a Victorian semi-industrialized London type of, of city, but with ghosts and, uh, you know, and uh, and canals. And it's a, a very fun kind of role playing uh, game. And you play as a bunch of um, you know underworld uh, low lifes who are just trying to barely scrape by, uh, but it takes the the concept of uh, of characters who are very very capable, uh, but uh, facing a you know, daunting odds. So it, it's um, it, it's a lot of fun where there's uh, you know opportunities for things get very very bad for your character, and then you have the opportunity to to have great successes. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a very good gaming forged in the, in forged in the dark is a very good gaming system. Blades in the dark is a great role-playing game. Uh, I'm, I'm going out to my, my regular gaming group to play Dungeons and Dragons tomorrow night. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be fun. Uh, but if I had a month, you know, because I'm the kind of person that looks to my deficiencies to be completely honest, I would jump into like tabletop war games. Um, you know, and, and learn some more of those, uh, you know, I've, I've played war, uh, war room recently, um, uh, a few, because our office is in Northern Virginia, of course, we had a power outage, um, a couple months ago. Right. And so, uh, we had a power outage at work. And so I grabbed one of our, um, you know, uh, senior analysts and I was like, Hey, you happen to have a, a copy of, uh, of Panzer leader in your office. Why don't we play that? Right. Um, I hadn't played it before. Right. Uh, so uh, so I played that, got a little smart on on World War Two tank uh, tactics. It was it was great. Uh, but I would I would play more like that. Um, but my all time favorite board game to date is Spirit Island, uh, which is uh, essentially the it's the opposite of Settlers of Catan, where instead of exploring a vacant island, you are the. Uh, the spirits of the natural spirits of the island uh, working to support the indigenous people of the island to kill the settlers and force them back into the ocean. <laughs> uh, it is a fantastic, <laughs> it is a fantastic uh, cooperative game where you, you work against the clock. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a fun game where you get to kill lots of imaginary people. Uh, it's a good time. Right. So. It's almost yeah. like you could call it like a uh, spiritual insurgency. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it really, really is. Charles? Yeah. The uh I I think yeah, just infinite amounts of time. I'd I'd probably reach for for Twilight Imperium first. Mm. Uh just because it's I, I've only played it through once, but but I, and I got crushed when I played, <laughs> but it was just such a fun like layering of of a number of different elements of a number of different games that I enjoy Axis and allies. There are elements of scythe in there, at least from my perspective uh, and, and elements of diplomacy as well uh, as you get farther along in the game and just seeing all of that kind of layered together is just cool and in kind of a space environment. Um, so, so that's uh, I'd, yeah. I'd love to play that. Um, the uh, I'd, I'd probably, 
you know, if I can get the right players in the room, you know, Twilight Struggle is another favorite. Um, just I, I, I enjoy the influence mechanics within the game and uh, like the, the Cold War backdrop to the game. Um, the uh, there, there are some unopened games on my shelf, you know, uh, Root and Evolution that I'd like to I've, I've seen played or I played like bits and pieces of but never mm -hmm. really got to play a complete game of. So love to go through those. And then um, there's uh, uh, games that I've just beaten to death that I probably reach for, like Settlers of Catan, um, that that I, I used to play like almost daily for for probably about a year in, in undergrad. And then uh, wow. um, uh, another game, Twixt, uh, that that I used to play a lot in high school with like one friend, and we both got really good at it. It's a really very cool, simple game. Uh, it's like a 1970s board game I got from my dad, and the idea is like, you know. You're, you're both building a bridge from one side of the board to the other and one's going you know horizontally one's going vertically and and so it becomes very quickly a game about outmaneuvering and outpositioning your opponent uh, mm. as you put pieces down to, to build your bridges um so we just you know me and a buddy of mine just like got immersed in that for like a year straight uh and, and when we would try to teach other people to play we just crush them completely <laughs> uh so it, it was it was a fun very obscure game well maybe, maybe not obscure we, we eventually learned that that uh in europe there are like conventions for it uh which is kind of cool uh so but but we at the very at the time in high school we thought it was really obscure and, and unknown <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Well, that's Should, pretty cool yeah I, I will make what one note on what what charles said uh root you said is still on your shelf yeah right so i i did play a demo of root once and the demo was was not good. This was at PAX mm. Unplugged 2019, being kind of confused. But then I was intrigued and went back to it. And I've, I've looked at Root. And even though Root is, on its surface, a game about a lot of very cute forest animals, right? I have heard people, uh, and, and I, I have very good reason to believe this, that Root is a game that is the best representation of the war in Afghanistan uh, that has ever been produced, right? That Root is a phenomenal war game, right? I don't know if it gets much play with the uh, Armchair Dragoon. <laughs> have, have you played it, Mo? No, I've not played it. No, no. but so, it's similar to pretty much the, the coin series. Is what it uh, it's 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 similar in in uh, in a lot of ways uh, in that you have a lot of different teams mm -hmm. and each team has its own set of win conditions yep. and also each team needs to <clears throat> excuse me needs to interact with at least one other uh, team in order to to win. Help so me, there's a lot of interaction. Screw those guys over so I can screw you over and win the game. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> That's but pretty much how it all works. Very out. cute forest animals. And yeah. it's, it's, it's really entertaining and very, very fun. So nice. you can pull that off. You should bring it to one of our training sessions, Charles, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and teach us all how to play. <laughs> all go. right. I'll, I'll put it on my list. <laughs> I'll sign up. There you go. Well, uh, that will wrap it up for tonight. I, we don't have any other questions from the audience and, I don't want to keep you guys all night. We've gone now 90 minutes so far, and I really do appreciate you taking the time tonight to join us for this seminar and give us some insight, a greater insight into the professional space and how it differs from the hobby space and then how they kind of intersect and where uh, hobby games can help you guys a little bit more. And maybe even hobby gamers can help you guys a little bit more as well. But uh, appreciate everybody for tuning in tonight to the seminar. We've got one tomorrow morning with Sebastian Bay. We're going to be talking about Littoral Commander. We also have one tomorrow afternoon with Bruce Maxwell. We're going to be talking about Aaron Armour. And then we have uh, Harold Buchanan that will be on with uh, another show at 5 o'clock tomorrow uh, after, I think that's right after the show that we've got with Bruce Maxwell. But I really appreciate everybody tuning in tonight, and we will catch you on the next one. Thanks again to our special guests, Chris Steinitz and Dr. Charles Cartier from the Center for Naval Analysis. We really appreciate you guys taking the time tonight. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks a lot to our, to our guests. Thank you for having us, Mo. Thanks for everyone for uh, hanging on and listening to us. Great questions. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Mo. Really appreciate it. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>